the SHRM chapter meeting. Um, we have a great presenter today, which Renette Filmer will introduce here in a few minutes. Um, but for myself and Naomi and Renette, who are board representatives today, we want to thank you for spending your time with us. And this should be a, a nice break from everything, like we were just saying, from your kids, from work, from all that's going on and being housebound as well for most of us. And I just wanted to thank you for today's time. We um, will be able to, if you have any questions throughout the presentation, we will go ahead and facilitate those on the chat area. And I will look at those and I will interrupt um, David, as he's presenting to answer or ask those questions and answer those for you. Um, everybody is muted right now, and I do ask that we stay that way um, out of respect for David so that we can hear him clearly. This will be recorded today, and I will make sure that the board distributes this to attendees after the meeting. And um, with that said, at the end of the meeting, I will um, pop up the screen that will show the H. Uh, HRCI and the SHRM accreditation credits for you all for continuing education, as well as we'll share that after um, when we send out the video link and if David has any um, presentation um, documents that he would like to share with us as well. But again, thank you for being here today and I will turn it over to Renette. Hi everybody, we're so glad that you're here. I want to introduce our speaker today, but before I introduce our speaker, I want to just couple a couple of things. Please get engaged in the comment section if you can. Uh, even if it's not a question, just a comment for David or um, to share information or something that you can relate to. You know, as we're all sitting at home, it's just nice sometimes to have that dialogue and be able to converse. Also, you know, I know some of you are eating, as Erin said, so if you don't want to be on video, we totally understand. Um, but if you're not, and you could just, you know, be on video while you're here today, it's great to see everybody's face and be able to engage with you that way. And as a speaker, I've done speaking as well. As a speaker, it's really nice to be able to see faces and know that you're actually talking to people. So if you can um, turn on your video, that's awesome. If you can't, we understand. But I want to um, introduce David. He has been so great to work with. David Shar. he is... Um, a president, he's the president of Illuminate PMC and a creator of the, the burnout proof culture model. Uh, he's a keynote speaker, consultant and trainer specializing in organizational improvement uh, with their leadership and culture, combat burnout, which we are all feeling burnout right now and design meaning, um, and he likes to design meaningful work. <clears throat> Excuse me. David combines decades of leadership experience with the latest psychological research to help attract retain and motivate our top talent. It's what we need to do right now is motivate. David holds a bachelor's in human resource management for, from Colorado State University and his master's in industrial organizational psychology from the University of Maryland College Park. He is a current doctoral candidate in business psychology at the Chicago School of Professional Psychology, where he is studying the interaction between meaningful work and burnout. David is not your typical academic. As a scientist, pra uh, practitioner, translator, David makes leadership theory and business psychology accessible, implementable, and fun through the use of humor and storytelling. So I'd like to introduce David Shar, but I'd also like to say if your businesses are in need of help, you know, help as far as burnout, David Shar is your go-to guy, and we will provide his information after this uh, presentation today. So, David, I'm going to roll it over to you. Thank you so much, Renette, and thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I know you guys are going through a lot right now. Um, Renette was kind enough to send me a link to one of your local news sources, and uh, I thought we had a bad in Baltimore with this new, like, new lockdown stuff. Um, you guys are going through a lot and have been headlining a lot of a lot of the stuff uh, over this over 2020 and and um, so I hope you are all doing well and staying safe um, and also taking care of yourself and your employees. Um, today we're going to be talking about building a kinder kind of workplace and that's kind of a moving target when we think about what that means uh, because that uh, 2020 is all about burnout. Um, and what our employees need from us right now is 
support more than ever. Uh, at the same time, it's very difficult to be providing that sort of support when we're the ones that are feeling burnout as well. Uh, wherever you are in the HR world, uh, your job got a lot more complicated recently. And so we need to remember to be taking care of ourselves and to be taking care of our people. I wanted to introduce you guys to a little bit of maybe new to you technology. Um, and uh, because it wouldn't be 2020 if we didn't do that. So uh, we're gonna have you go to Poll Everywhere and we're gonna put a link to it in the chat right now. Thank you, David. So uh, there's another David off camera, by the way. So uh, we're, we're actually live downtown Baltimore um, from a studio. Uh, not because I need the studio, but because this is where my, my five kids and 120 pound dog can't find me, by the way. So um, we're going to go to Poll Everywhere. And if you pull it up on your phone, this website address, or you just click it and open it in a different tab, that's fine. Just make sure to come back afterwards. But we're going to ask you a couple of questions throughout this presentation uh, where I really want your feedback. So to start it off, here's the question. How burned out do you feel right now in this moment of time? And can everybody see this, uh, this scale over here? It's everything from the red frowny face to the, to the green smiley face, right? Red, red, uh, green smiley face means you are feeling good, you're feeling energized, you're feeling motivated every day, hopping out of bed, can't, can't wait to start your work. The red frowny face is more like you spend most of your days curled up in the fetal position, uh, maybe wearing an oversized red bathrobe, um, not talking about anybody specific because my wife sometimes does watch the videos of my talks, but that's okay. Um, but I want to know where you guys fit on this scale. So on your poll everywhere access, you can click anywhere in there and um, where it represents, that represents you best where you're feeling today. Do we have anybody clicking in there? Yeah, yeah we got, um, it's like everyone's in the middle. Nobody's okay, on either so, extreme. All right, so we're in the middle. That's good. That's good. Now, I want to say something about this scale because this scale is about more than where you are on the scale. It actually is much more important to understand not only where you are, but also the fact that people are everywhere on this scale. So I don't usually cite Facebook memes, but I'm going to right now because I fell in love with this thing as soon as Corona really took hold and we started to get a glimpse of what 2020 would be looking like for us. Uh, there was this meme going around, and maybe some of you saw it. Um, the meme basically said, while we, all, while we are all in the same storm, we are not all in the same boat. Because it's easy to think, well, I'm experiencing corona, and they're experiencing corona, so I'm dealing with it. Why aren't they dealing with it? Or vice versa, how are they dealing with it so well, and I can't get out of bed in the morning? We have to remember that everything from our genetic makeup, where we are uh, psychologically, like we have these five big innate um, psychological traits. We're all born with these traits that determine how neurotic we're gonna be or how extroverted we're gonna be. And all these different things are gonna be interacting with your experience. Likewise, many people have been home alone in true isolation throughout this experience. And they're just hungry for human interaction. Conversely, like I said, I've got five kids and a big dog at home. I can't wait for Corona to be over so I can send them all out of the house. So we're all experiencing this, but we're experiencing it in different ways. So if there was ever a time for empathy, that time is now. But what is burnout? When we talk about burnout, which we see on the news, the New York Times just came out with an article about um, doctors and other medical professionals burning out. Um, we've seen teachers, um, a recent poll of teachers, uh, 30, I believe it was 32% of teachers said that they were not considering leaving their current school before coronavirus, but are considering it now. And this was in August when they, when they last polled them. That 32% intent to turn over is a scary, scary number. And so we're seeing this burnout, which used to be only in those sorts of professions, happening 
everywhere. I was speaking to uh, restaurant owners in Texas, and you better believe that they were feeling it. Um, so what is burnout, though? I want to get into that because to truly defeat burnout and to ensure that your uh, employees are not going to be experiencing burnout, to build a burnout-proof culture, uh, we need to start by understanding the term, understanding what exactly burnout is, what brings it on, and then, as my 13-year-old son would say, then we can hack it. We can start adjusting how we, how we interact with our culture and leadership in order to influence um, the environment and reduce turnout, reduce uh, burnout, rather. So when we think about burnout, this is from the, from the 50s or 60s when burnout first became a research topic, um, burnout very quickly was recognized as having three distinct legs. The first of which was emotional exhaustion. Emotional exhaustion is often uh, misunderstood. This is the, this is the key piece uh, with burnout. And, and raise your hands if you have felt a little emotionally exhausted over the past um, nine or 10 months. I know I have. In our lives, everywhere, um, we're overloaded. And it turns out that emotional exhaustion, when we think about burnout traditionally, we would think about burnout in terms of, oh yeah, burnout's when you have a whole bunch of work that's put on you and you're overloaded with work. It turns out that that's not exactly where burnout comes from because you got into HR for a reason and we're gonna, we're gonna get to that, but you got into HR for a reason. You like the work theoretically that you came in there to, to, to perform. But when the work starts uh, becoming, taking the back seat to all of the distractors, to the bureaucracy, to the extra regulation, to coronavirus, that's when we start seeing people burn out. The second piece of burnout is cynicism. This is originally known and still known within certain fields that are very client, patient, uh, student facing as uh, depersonal, depersonalization. I hate that word, it's so long. Depersonalization, because the way we first recognized this was that when we burn out and we're feeling emotionally exhausted, what we do is for our own psychological safety, we set up this safety net by separating ourselves from our client, our customer, our patient, our student, and in HR, from your employees or from management. We start seeing them as employee number 216747 instead of Todd in accounting because it's too painful when everything is being overloaded on us and we are emotionally exhausted. We don't want to think about Todd as this individual autonomous human being that relies on us. Instead, we start to think about Todd as just another employee and we start separating ourselves. Now, something interesting happens in the road from emotional exhaustion to uh, cynicism or depersonalization. And that is, down uh, gender lines. So what we see is that um, women typically, and we've seen this with teachers specifically, they will be very high in emotional exhaustion while relatively low in cynicism and depersonalization when they're burned out. Men, male teachers on the other hand, we find them to be higher in cynicism and lower in emotional exhaustion. And in a way, in a sense, this makes sense when we're talking about averages, obviously, but it, it makes sense in a way that there are two different coping mechanisms here. One is that taking teachers, for instance, teachers who are feeling emotionally exhausted are still, they want to connect with their students. They're going to be martyrs, and they're just going to keep pushing forward. And in reality, it doesn't help anyone when that happens. But the male teachers, on average, say, no, 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 I'm just gonna back up because I'm in pain here, I'm emotionally exhausted, I'm overwhelmed, so I'm gonna set up this little boundary and protect myself. Kind of an interesting breakdown, but all of us, it doesn't matter your sex or gender, you um, are gonna approach this one way or another. Um, and this is why burnout can look, it's slightly different between individuals. The final piece of burnout is a reduced sense of personal accomplishment or efficacy. 
So this is where you start feeling like you are churning your wheels twice as fast and getting half as much done. I am willing to wager that this one feels familiar to almost everyone in the room right now. Does it feel familiar to you? Over 2020, this sense of personal accomplishment that we feel like we are trying harder than ever. And we're looking and thinking, I'm not having an impact. What is happening? Or I don't feel appreciated. Or I'm not paid enough to be doing this right now. And that's where we see this intense turnover with teachers, where we see um, doctors retiring early. So how do we get here specifically? There's a great model called the demand control support model. And I love this for its simplicity. What this model argues is that when demand goes up, meaning suddenly we've got all this bureaucracy, interpersonal conflict, maybe we've got all this stuff, this junk in our work standing between us and our true work. And simultaneously, we find that our sense of control goes down and our sense of support from coworkers and from supervisors is low. That is the highway to burnout. And when you look at our lives right now, demand, every job across the planet has changed in some fundamental way since the beginning of 2020. Control, when we look at the news, you feel out of control. We keep getting different answers. It doesn't matter which news station you watch, everybody's um, everybody is saying one thing one minute and then, and then the facts on the ground change and, and the, uh, the, the talking heads start disagreeing with each other. We want answers and the answers aren't there. We want to know when this is going to be done. And that answer no one can tell you. And so we feel like this lack of control in our lives, which by the way is directly connected to feelings of depression, this loss of of feeling this learned helplessness that, that we, don't, we are no longer in control of our own destiny. And this lack of support. I don't know about you guys, I'm probably too old to be admitting this, but when I have a really bad day, I wanna give my mom a hug. I'm, I live right down the street from my mom and I haven't been able to give her a hug or come within six feet of her for nine or 10 months now. And so there is this feeling of isolation, this feeling that we have a lack of support and from our coworkers and from your fellow SHRM members, connecting through Zoom is not the same thing. So what can we do about it? I wanna to talk to you guys about the man. So I grew up um, in an Orthodox Jewish home. And I don't know how many of you are familiar with the culture, but let's just say it took me until college when I realized I was a horrible dancer. So growing up in the Orthodox Jewish community, dancing to me meant that I'd get in a big circle, everyone would hold hands, and we would walk to the right, or we would walk to the left if we wanted to be really fancy, that was dancing. There's an old story in that community. And the story goes that this man was traveling out of town and he goes to a wedding being held in the social hall of a really old synagogue. And so he gets in the circle and he's dancing and he notices something really, really strange. Every time people got to this one specific spot on the dance floor, they bowed. He had never seen a custom like this. This would treat him. So he turned to the man next to him and he said, excuse me, why every time we get to that one spot do we bow? And the man said, oh, great question. We've always done that. He said, yeah, but why? And the man said, I don't know, because that's how we do it. And after the man pushed, the, the, the guests kept pushing. The man said, ask the rabbi. So he goes to the rabbi, the rabbi is embarrassed. He doesn't know the answer, but it's what we've always done. He's sure that it's got this holy reason to it. But the only person who might have an answer is that guy, and he points out, to the elder of the synagogue, the one guy that was there from the beginning. And he asked him the same question. And the elder looks at him and he says, oh, that? There used to be a chandelier there. There used to be a chandelier there. 
And so for decades, everyone bowed, they ducked when they got to where the chandelier used to be. And I am willing to bet that that's happening in your organization. How many chandeliers are you bowing for? How many things in your culture, how many customs in your culture, either your written policy or your culture, the unwritten policy, how much of that is just there because it used to make sense or even worse because it made sense for some competitor that you benchmarked against. But it just remains. One of my biggest frustrations before Corona, I would walk into organizations and say, why are you doing any telework? It's what your employees are asking for. And I'd always get these answers, ah, it's, we've just never done, we, it's not something we do. Of course it's not something you do because we never had the technology to do it in the past. It reminded me of, and I have to admit, I used to be a biology student. I, was, uh, I had this goal of being um, a veterinarian because I thought I could just play with dogs all day. Turns out I needed to be good at math and science, so that's where I am now. But when I was in biology, before it was sort of a joint decision between me and every science professor I ever had that maybe I should switch to business, um, I learned about this concept called vestigial structures. Vestigial structures, a great example of this are your wisdom teeth. They're things that once existed for a reason. Your wisdom teeth, apparently, we used to eat different things, and so our wisdom teeth were really helpful in breaking down that food, the types of foods we used to eat. Our diet has obviously changed, and so our, we have no need for our wisdom teeth anymore. And in fact, our entire jaw, jaw structure has changed. But the wisdom teeth have remained. And now, instead of being the key to our survival, the key to our nourishment, they are a pain, literally and figuratively, for almost every teenager or early 20-something in the world. And we have to go, we have to get them extracted. That's what this was, when people would say, oh, no, 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 we don't do telework. And there are so many other things within your organization that you might be continuing to do and now our world has completely changed just in the past nine months. You have to ask yourself, why am I still doing it? And when we understand demand is all the things that get in the way, they get in between us and the job that we are here to do. Just as you are in HR for a reason, your employees entered your organization, their line of work for a reason. And every little thing that stands in the way of them accomplishing their why is something that's leading them directly toward burnout. The second piece here is control. And with control, we talk about autonomy and even more specifically, decision authority. Like I said before, we are experiencing learned helplessness. You had plans. Whatever your plans were, you had plans. You knew something about where you were going, the trajectory of your life, and then what? 2020 hit, and now we're lost. And so you feel out of control. And now work can be, can, can pile on more of that loss of sense of control, or it can be the antidote. It can be the place where you go to find control. When we talk to our employees, it's not just about telling them what to do and telling them that you're here for them, that's great. But when you are just telling them what to do, they continue to feel lost and powerless. And also when you say, here's what I need you to do, you do it how you wanna do it. That's not good enough either, the research shows. The research shows that they need decision authority. That you need to go to them and say, what do you think we should do? Give them a say. And that will give them some power. When we find that people are feeling depressed, what do we tell them to do? Oftentimes you'll suggest jog around the block. Because if you can get yourself just to go around the block once, you're now in control. And that's gonna start spilling over. 
So I want to go back to Poll Everywhere here. And I want to understand, we talked about your why. I want to understand your why. Why did you choose to work in HR? If you can answer this with one word, that would be great. But you don't have to limit yourself to one word, just one word at a time. We have a smaller group today. Um, so if there's multiple reasons, I want you to put those up. But, but submit them as separate, as separate things if, if it will, will allow you to. And so if you click right over your poll everywhere, you should be able to enter those. And David's gonna read them off for me. I got people. People, that one comes up in HR every time. I love it. That is the essence of what we do. What else are we seeing? Satisfaction. Satisfaction. Impact. This impact. Best help, self-impact. Nice, nice. To help people impact people. Help feel. It's beautiful. And you can, you can add some more because um, I'm gonna send this to you guys as well. Make sure that you add this image um, along, with the, along with the rest of the slides. Uh, and we're gonna come back to this. So for now, we're gonna move on. But I want you guys to look at that and remember what it is that you got in this for. Um, a lot of people feel like they're now looking for an exit because HR is not all it's cracked up to be, especially now. Um, my argument for you is this is exactly why you got into it. If you got into it to make an impact, if you got into it for the people, if you got into it to help, this is exactly the time that HR needs you more than ever. People are lost and you are in that seat where you can help them maybe more than anything, because work more than anything brings some sense of control and some sense of purpose right now. The final piece of this DCS demand control support model is support. And support needs to come in two ways, emotional support, emotional support being, I'm here for you, I'm a sounding board, tell me your problems, that sort of stuff. And then there's instrumental support. And that's actually helping people, help lift their load a little bit wherever you can. So when I first got married, my wife and I, um, my wife would go off to work and she'd come back and she's a first grade teacher and she would start um, complaining about things that happened at, at work and complaining about the kids and what. And I used to jump in and I'd be like, okay, what can I do to help? How can I help? Here's what I think you should do. And she would come to me up and she's like, stop. We'd be like, what do you mean stop? You came to me for help. She said, I don't want you to talk. I want to talk. She just wanted me to listen. So I got it. And so the next day she came home from work and she started telling me about work and then telling me about these issues that we were having with our son. And I said, I hear you, I'm here for you. And she said, what are you talking about? I said, what do you mean, what am I talking about? I'm here for you. And she said, no, I need you to jump in here. I can't do this all on my own. You gotta take care of our son. How do you know when somebody's coming to you for emotional support versus instrumental support? Here's a trick. Ask them, ask them. And by the way, people don't ask. People jump to, to uh, conclusions and oftentimes are wrong and get themselves yelled at like I did. But when you do ask somebody, oftentimes it will knock them off their feet for a second. It will make them think, what do I want from this conversation? Why am I here? And through that, you end up having a much more productive time where you are more capable to help somebody. I was once giving one of these talks and somebody said, yeah, but people always come and nag. I'm like, your, if your employees aren't nagging you, sometimes somebody can be negative and just want to complain about, fine, let's get to the root cause. Why is that happening? But when somebody is coming to you and nagging, oftentimes they just need to have a voice. They need a sounding board. They need you to be there for them. And that is as essential as you being there to support them through this crisis in other more constructive, I guess, ways. It's hard to ask for help. And so if we go over to poll everywhere, this can be 
Um, you can put in an answer here. I believe it, it can be a full sentence. Uh, you put in an answer here. What can your coworkers do to support you? And I think this is important to do within the safe space like your Sherm chapter and where the answers are anonymous. Because what I find is that people find it difficult to ask for help. And I find that this happens the more tenured you are. It happens the more along that line that you get where people start, or you act, you at least assume that people think of you as the one with all the answers. The issue here is that, so I had a, I had a call after one of these talks. I was talking to teachers and my phone rings almost directly afterwards. And it's a teacher who had been working for like 30 years, she had been working. And she said, thank you so much for letting me know that it was okay to not know, to not have all the answers right now, to not be able to handle this on my own right now. Because she had started her school year thinking, nope, I'm the tenured teacher, I've got to figure this out. And now you have this 50 something year old woman trying to figure out Zoom for the first time in her life and thinking that because she wasn't being super effective teaching her students over Zoom, that that was some sort of reflection on her as a teacher and even more so as a tenured teacher. She had forgotten how to ask others for help. So I think it's extremely important that you read this slide. And what are they saying, David? Oh, all kinds of stuff. Ask, They're communicate, ask. collaboration, understand. Understand, collaboration. Um, empathetic, priorities. Empathy. Yes, I love these answers. And these are, these are golden and they're so important. Positive and, and optimistic. Sorry. And it's so important that you know that you can go out there and you can, you can ask for help. You might feel like, like you're some sort of imposter or failure by asking others, but that's not how others are seeing it. We just said somebody wants you to ask don't make me guess what you need. Tell me what you need. That's how I can, that's how I can help you. Tell me what, what, ask me if I need help and that'll make me feel better uh, and more comfortable saying yes. Show me some empathy, understand where I am. I was speaking to a board um, and we did what can your coworkers do to, or what can your fellow board members do to help? And somebody said, answer my emails. <laughs> And somebody else said, give me space. I thought it was gonna have to break out, break, break up a fight on Zoom. It was crazy. And this is when I brought it back to the beginning of this talk where I said, don't just recognize where you are on that scale, recognize where everyone else is. That if you are feeling completely, you know, it used to be that I would say, how are you? And you would say, great. And if you said anything else, you were a weirdo, right? I mean, that's the way society works. That's our cultural norm. How are you? Great, good, okay, bye. In 2020, if I say, how are you? And you say, great, you seem insensitive. Like, what? You're great? We feel ashamed if we're feeling great. We feel ashamed if we're feeling awful. It's as if there is no right answer. But I'm gonna tell you that all of the answers are the right answer. It is 100% okay for 2020 to be your best year ever. You are on an individual journey. Nobody has the same package of personality traits and life experiences and journey that you do. And it is a-okay and great, and I'm happy for you if you're doing amazing right now. It is equally okay and normal and completely understandable if you are struggling every single day. There is no shame in that. And we need to take this lesson with us. This is the first time that I can think of where we are all, besides for maybe 9-11, where we are all suffering together. But make no mistake, on January 1st, one of your employees was experiencing their 2020. In August 2018, one of your employees was experiencing your, their 2020. It's not like this is the only year where people are having a rough time. 
We're just having a rough time together. So we always need to be aware of where the others are on that scale and be open to the fact that they might be feeling good and might be feeling bad about feeling good. They might be feeling bad and be feeling bad about feeling bad. Um, okay, so let's talk about what you can do about this. So we know, all right, demand control support. We know burnout, it, it, high demand, people need to be um, supported, and you can do that from your seat in HR, for sure, you can reach out and support people. You can, you can help them by giving them more autonomy and control and taking out those vestigial policies, right? Like vestigial structures, taking those things out of your culture, or your handbook, and, and really letting them focus on the job itself, except how many of you can actually do that? How many of you have the authority to do that? Because in a typical Sherm chapter, not everybody is the HR director. There are first year um, people in benefits and there's, and there's people in recruiting and people that might not have the same um, authority or power within the organization as others sitting in this Zoom room. And so what can you do about it? Well, I would argue that you can go and influence others from anywhere within the organization. How do you build a kinder kind of workplace? Be kinder. And I know that sounds really oversimplified. And I think, I think in a way it is. But in a way, it's not. In a way, we misunderstand our power in these situations. One of my favorite experiments of all time. They brought together a room full of people. Big group of people, and they let them loose in a huge auditorium. Nothing interesting about this auditorium except that on the walls there were big letters. There was an A, a B over here, a C, and a D over here. And they let them all into the room with three instructions. They said to them, they said, we want you to walk into this room and not communicate with any other person. And when we say communicate, do not talk, do not touch, do not motion, nothing. That's rule number one. Rule number two, we want you to always stay within an arm's reach, not touching, but within an arm's reach of at least one other person as you walk through this room. Rule number three, walk randomly. And they sent them all in. What people didn't understand was beforehand they had called maybe three or four people aside and they said, all right, we're gonna lay out these rules, but you have a slightly modified set of rules. They said, first rule is the same. You cannot communicate with anybody in any way whatsoever. Rule number two is the same. You need to stay within an arm's reach, but do not touch, but stay within an arm's reach of at least one other person at all times. Rule number three, we want you to make your way to marker C, the wall where C is written on the wall. And so when they let all these people in, they all sort of start milling in every which way, and slowly but surely, they all begin to congregate right there at marker C. Kind of interesting. What, what was happening here is flocking behavior, right? I told you, I flunked out of science, so me explaining to you flocking behavior, that, we're not going that way. But what I found extremely fascinating about this study was what happened afterwards. The researchers went to the participants and they said, how'd you end up here? And the answer again and again and again was, I don't know, it was random. And when the researchers told them, no, you were actually led here, nobody believed them. This is true leadership. This is, we know this from change management theory. That change, we think, comes from the top down and is dictated what true change, lasting change, needs to come from the bottom up. So how do you create a kinder kind of workplace? How do you create a workplace that's gonna uh, diminish burnout? It starts with you. No matter what seat you're in, walk the walk. And people will follow you. And the coolest thing ever is that they won't even realize that they're following you. We know about this concept of emotional contagion. Emotional contagion is, Basically, we found that 
primates, humans, um, primates of all kinds, and birds share these things called mirror neurons. And what a mirror neuron is, is basically that when my brain flashes these things, your brain flashes these things, it's the same things. They, they were doing an experiment on monkeys. And they had the monkeys hooked up with these funny hats and they're looking at their brain waves. And the little intern comes in, it's hot day, starts licking an ice cream. And they see one of these monkeys that's all hooked up, staring at the guy and specifically at his ice cream. And what they expect to see with his brain activity is that he's watching somebody eat ice cream. And therefore, maybe he would um, have some sort of activity that would suggest that he is craving ice cream. But no, his brain, the monkey's brain lights up, indicating that he, the monkey, is currently eating ice cream. He was literally experiencing the same thing that that man, the intern, was experiencing. This is what we have inside of us. This is part of our DNA. And that's why this works. Why you being positive will rub off on others and they in turn will start being positive. We know that moods are incredibly contagious, even more contagious than Corona. And you know this, you've been in a room where somebody walks in with this dark cloud and you literally feel it. You literally feel it. But did you know that positive emotion is at least as, and some studies suggest, more contagious than negative emotion. Try it. Turn and smile at somebody in the room with you, if there is somebody, right? It's contagious. It's contagious. And so all you need to do is walk into your workplace tomorrow and be happy, or get on your Zoom call and be happy. All done, right? Not so fast. We also know that there is something called toxic positivity. Toxic positivity is a really scary thing. That basically, when you act super positive, and we've got these optimists out there that are always pouring it on, and oh, everything's great, and you see people in a negative mood, and you're trying to make them feel good, everything's okay, and, and you gotta look at it in a different way, that can actually be damaging and make them feel more alone and set them up for failure, burn trust. And so you can't just put on a happy face and go out there if you're the one feeling burnout. That won't work. It'll have the opposite effect. Because I promise you, when you have a real smile on, even behind that mask, people see it and they notice it and they, and they, they understand it. Because when we have a real smile, our whole body smiles. But when we put on a show because we think we have to tell everybody everything's great, nobody believes you. It's 2020. And so they're going to see right through it. So if you need to actually be in a good mood and actually be feeling positive, how do you make that happen? I want to give you a quick problem. I told you I am horrible at science and specifically math. But I'm gonna give you a quick problem. So if you have a pen and paper next to you, you go ahead and grab that. A calculator, if you, if you have one accessible, would be fine too. I'm gonna to tell you the bus problem. And excuse me, because I'm gonna read it. I don't wanna mess up the bus problem here. You're driving a bus. The bus comes to its first stop. Five people get off. Is everybody with me? Give me a thumbs up if you're with me. Bus comes to the first stop, five people get off. The bus then makes a right turn. Where three people get off and two people get off. The bus then makes a left turn followed by another left turn where seven people get on and two people get off. Finally, the bus makes a right turn followed by a left turn and pulls up to the last stop of the day. Here is the question for you. And we'll go back to Poll Everywhere for this. What color are the bus driver's eyes? You go ahead and select your choice here, excuse me. And David, what are we seeing here? 
Let's see if anyone's commented yet. Lou, is this a trick question? All right, we've got a lot of it. It's a trick question. What percentage of people said that? 71. Whoa, 71. And what's the lower category there? Uh, we got blue is blue. 29. Blue. Okay. Who said, who said blue? Somebody raising their hand for blue? I don't see. There's okay. a lot of people with their cameras. On. Whoever gets blue, whoever got blue, they get bonus points as long as that's the right answer. Because, yeah, actually the right answer is, of course it's a trick question. Why would I ask it otherwise? I will say that there was one person that did admit it was Candace that said that she put blue. She put blue. Why, Candace? Can she tell us? It's the color of my eyes. It's the color of her eyes. When I began the problem, I said, you are driving a bus. This is on videotape. You can rewind it if you don't believe me at the end. But you are driving a bus. Candace's eye color is blue. She's the driver. So the correct answer would have been whatever color eyes you have. But of course, it's a trick question. And to understand what this is all about, um, I want to take you on a brief trip with me to Arizona um, many years ago, too many for me to think of. But the bus problem is clearly a focus problem and not a bus problem because what were you guys doing? You were thinking it's the math problem, lots of numbers here. Or if you were trying to outsmart me, you were probably thinking, oh, he's talking a lot about right and left turns. It's going to be a directional sort of thing. But of course, we rarely see the thing that's right in front of us if it's not what we're looking for. So a while back, my wife and I had just had our first kid. Newborn son, had no idea what we were doing, no idea. And um, I got invited to go out to Arizona to do a week of training. So I went to my wife. She, we're still like putting diapers on his head. We're like trying to figure this out. And I said, hey, honey, so, and I broke the news. And she said, I said, but, but my mom's right down the block. So if you need anything, and she said, what do you mean? We're coming with you. I said, we, who, what? And she said, me and our son, we're coming with you. I said, how are you coming with me to Arizona? What are you going to do? So my wife and I were relatively newly married, like a year and some change married. We had a brand new baby. And we're like, we were, we were one of those obnoxious couples. My wife was not exactly Miss Independent at the time, and neither was I. We were like connected like this. And so what was she going to do? She was going to come to Arizona with me and sit in a hotel as I went and did this training from nine to five every day. She said, no, we're going to rent a car. Me and, our son, me and our son, we're going to jump in the car every day. We're going to drop you off at the training, and then we're going to go explore Arizona. And now, we're from um, Baltimore, so I don't know if you know about the Northeast. We're very small states around here. And so she thinks she'll just traverse Arizona every day because Maryland, you could do that in a couple hours. <laughs> but this was her plan. So we get to Arizona and we rent this car. And this car was really interesting. It was really cool. It looked like a hearse, but not in a depressing way, like a, a cool way, right? I don't know what that means, but uh, this car really looks like a hearse. And um, my wife um, rents the car and she does exactly what she said she was going to do. She starts driving this car everywhere around Arizona, drops me off, goes on a trip comes back, tells me about her day, does it again, does it again, does it again, each day. It was amazing. And now she is falling madly in love with this car because, I mean, this was like not just a cool car, but this was now linked to her, her new feelings of independence. So at the end of our trip, we get to the airport and return the car. She literally gives it a hug and says, you know, our van is on its last legs. I said, yeah. She said, when we get back to Baltimore, let's get one of these. I said, honey, we can't get one of these. She said, why not? I said, because this is a West Coast car. She said, what's a West Coast car? I said, Rachel, the West Coast car. Have you ever seen one of these on the East Coast? She said, well, no. I said, exactly, neither have I. We only sell them on the West Coast. Now, for those of you 
who know as little about cars as I do. There's no such thing as a West Coast car. But don't want to spoil the end. So we end up jumping in the airplane, um, flying back to Baltimore. We get to long-term parking where a van is parked. We're walking, making our way over there, and my wife starts freaking out. She starts hitting me, screaming. I'm like, what? What's going on? Three spots down from our van, the West Coast car. We then get in the van, start driving down the highway toward our home. She starts freaking out again, almost runs me off the road as we pass the West Coast car. Things were getting weird, but I didn't fully feel like I was in the twilight zone, or would it be like Black Mirror now? Is that what the younger people were calling it? But I didn't fully feel like we were in the twilight zone until we pulled it into our neighborhood. And our neighbor, maybe six or seven houses down in their driveway, the West Coast car. So what in the world was happening here? Either this car ended, ended up selling like hotcakes in the one week we were in Arizona, or there was something else going on. And as it turns out, the 2007 Dodge Magnum never sold like hotcakes. So what was happening? A couple years earlier, my wife and I decided to do something stupid. We jumped out of an airplane. How many of you have gone skydiving? So, none of you? I'm not seeing any. So, so you're- One. One. So, on average, you guys are, are much less reckless than us. So, we decided we're gonna jump out of an airplane. So, when you go to jump out of an airplane, you show up and they take your money, and then they send you to training. By the way, no money back, no cancellations. They have your money. So now they'll explain to you how if your chute doesn't open and you damage property, your estate's going to have to pay for it. And they're like, what? And then in that training, they explain something else to you. They explain to you this concept of sensory overload. And what sensory overload is, is this idea that when you step out of an airplane for the first time in your life, Suddenly, you are hit with all of these senses that you have never felt before in your life. Everything is, quite figuratively and literally, rushing up at you, and your brain is trying to focus on something, doesn't know what to focus on, so you black out. Now, chivalry is not dead, so we get up to whatever thousand feet we need to be flying at, and I tell my wife, please, ladies first. So she goes tumbling out of the airplane, with the guy strapped to her back because we're doing tandem jumping and she's on her way to her and I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. How do I back out now? So the guy on my back refused to back out and we go tumbling out after. That's all I remember. I blacked out, sensory overload big time. Did you see on the video, the guy's pulling at my hair. I used to have some. He's like doing everything to get my attention, slapping at my cheeks. Nothing is waking me up. I told him I wanted to pull the cord. The guy refused to pull the cord because I told him I wanted to pull the rip cord. Um, eventually, he ends up pulling the cord because I am out of it. Um, and we had, end up landing and with enough time to take off our parachute and watch my wife come in for a landing. Apparently, we were not supposed to free fall for that long. But that sends me overload. And what is it at its core? Well, it turns out that we have protections in our brains. We, in the sense of, we have the world's oldest spam filter, most primitive spam filter. Because if we didn't, what would prevent us from opening the front door in the morning and hearing the birds and the bees and the smell, see, the smelling the smells and seeing the sights and suddenly just, we would face plant on the ground because our, our brain would be overloaded. We'd be driving down the highway and see the West Coast car and see, you know, the dogs being walked along the side of the road and see all these things and license plates and listen to the radio and we would black out. So instead, our brain has come up with this spam filter that before we even know what's going on, unconsciously, our brain looks at every detail and says relevant, and then it goes to our conscious mind, or irrelevant, and we're never even aware that it's there. Fuck right out of the brain. Turns out that 95% of our thinking happens non-consciously. 95%. You know this because how many times have you been 
So you took a vacation. You're heading off to wherever you're going, and you pass the exit for work and find yourself in the parking lot at work. You're like, well, because you were driving unconsciously, as scary as that might be. But this is how our brain works. And here's why it's relevant. This sensory overload. Here's why it's relevant. When we were cavemen and women, stepping out of our cave for the first time, if your great, great, great ancestors were the type of people that would walk out of their cave and first thing, oh, look at the sunrise. They wouldn't be here today. The people who survived were the ones that peeked out of their cave and looked for the saber-toothed tiger that might be hanging out in the grass. Those are the people. So we know that we have this negativity bias that has genetically been passed on to us. And then we make it even worse. Because what do we tell people at work? What do we tell people in school? My wife tells her first graders that they need to be good problem solvers. And to be a good problem solver, you need to be a good problem finder. So we literally train ourselves at work to find the smoke before it becomes a fire. We train ourselves to limit risk. And so we're constantly looking for the negative and our brain filter is telling us, yup, that's negative. We need to be totally aware of that guy, right? You see a problem employee, that's the top of your list. Not the all-star, the all-star can wait if you even notice. And so this is a problem. And so now in Corona where you turn on the news and you see like everything within 2020, coronavirus, racial injustice, um, uh, like a, a fracturing of society between the left and the right, you can't escape the things that wildfires, you can't escape all this negativity It's being brought right into your living room, right into your lives every single day. And it's so relevant, and we need to be aware of these things. We need to. But at the same time, we need to be aware of the positive in our life. And so my family and I started this thing that comes originally from Martin Seligman, founder of Positive Psychology. We coined it our favorite three. Because in my family, we're split down the center. We've got the optimist, that's me, and then what my wife likes to sensitively call um, the realist. That's her. And so the realists would have difficult periods where they'd really be feeling down and not seeing the good in their life. And so we started doing this thing where every night, doesn't matter where in the country I might be, I would dial in and every single night we'd get together and we would discuss our favorite three. Everybody needed to come up with three things from their day, three positive things in their day. And what would happen? We would start to retrain that spam filter. And the same way that my wife and I cannot go anywhere without seeing one of those West Coast Guards, one of those Dodge Magnums, if it's there, by the way, not a lot of them left. But when there is one, I see it 100% of the time. The same way we're able to do that, we can start retraining our brain to look at the positive so that it's no longer toxic positivity, so that the positivity is real, that we are no longer blind to the positive. And by the way, for those of you who are very critical thinkers and say, no, we need to be focused on these problems. I promise you, those won't go away. The problems are here. You'll still see them, but you'll also see the positive in them. And when that happens, you can start walking the walk. You can start making your way to marker C because that's how you are living your life. That's how you're really seeing it. You are, you are seeing the positive around you, even in times like this. And you can start leading your employees there. And you can start feeding in wherever you can ideas of more autonomy and decision authority, giving other people power, empowering others. And not just that, but also support, emotional support. And also supporting them in ways that are more, more realistic, that ways that you can actually jump in there and help in more functional ways. And you can go in there and do whatever you can to reduce the noise in their life, all that stuff that's getting in the way of them doing what it is that they want to do. Um, I, want to, I want to finish with one story here. Um, I know we're a couple minutes over. Just want to finish with one story, if that's okay. Okay. So my wife 
um, took the kids uh, to go see my in-laws. They live out in the boondocks for us. So like you go from the city to the suburbs to nothing but fields and, and woods and things like that. And my in-laws do what I call the rickless goodbye. They're the rick lie or ricklesses. And they do this rickless goodbye that takes forever. So my wife probably started saying goodbye at about two o'clock in the afternoon. Lo and behold, it's nine o'clock at night. Kids need to get home. Our two oldest at that time, we had our five-year-old sitting in the middle seat, looking outside the window as they drove home. And in the way back, our three-year-old in her car seat, presumably fast asleep. So my wife has the radio off, just gentle, quiet ride home. Until my son speaks up because he's looking out the window and they pass a herd of deer and he says, mommy, what's the purpose of deer? My wife thinks and says, remember she's a first grade teacher, so she turns it right back on him and says, I don't know, honey, what do you think the purpose of deer is? And they go back and forth, what's the purpose of deer? To add grace to the world, to feed the foxes. That was his idea, he's not 13, he's fine, but that was a little disturbing. But uh, they go back and forth until it gets quiet in the car again. And then from that back seat where everybody thought my daughter, Rena, was fast asleep, they hear this little peep. Mommy, what's my purpose? My wife's mind starts spinning a mile a minute. What is Rena's purpose? This little three-year-old girl, is she going to be the first female president of the United States? Is she going to uh, create the next Facebook or the next cure for cancer, figure out a cure for cancer? What is she gonna do? And before my wife can utter a sound, my son, five years old, says, that's easy, Rena. Your joy, that's your purpose. You make people happy. My son understood what we all once understood and then what we all tend to forget. That a purposeful life, a meaningful life, it does not need to, last, to land you on the cover of Time Magazine. That a purposeful life, a meaningful life, is a life that is lived in your authentic self, where you impact those around you through your kindness, through your honesty, through whatever it is that makes you, you, through your humor, whatever it is, you start impacting those around you. And through the butterfly effect, they affect the people around them, and they impact the people around them until before you know it, the entire world has changed. Right now in 2020, many of us are questioning our purpose because we were on this trajectory for greatness. We were doing great things and doing it in a big way and suddenly the world got quiet. And suddenly we are stuck thinking about who we are once again. And I'm here to tell you that that's what it's about. What my five-year-old taught me, that it's about connecting to your authentic self and having an impact on your organization, on your employees, on leadership, on your friends, your family, and the world around you. I hope that this helped. Um, you can uh, contact me here, or you can also um, uh, scan this if you, wanna, if you want um, more information from me. It's a mailing list thing, but I don't spam, I promise. Um, thank you guys so much um, for hosting me, and thank you for, um, for being so generous with your time today. I truly appreciate it. And do we have any questions? Great stories and ideas. This is just what I needed today. Thank you for being a breath of fresh air. I feel ready to conquer the world. <laughs> do it. Um, a lot of, uh, right, one, we write, um, our family writes down one positive takeaway from the day and puts it in their positive box. Love it. And uh, I live alone, but when I have dinner with family, we all say what our favorite part of the day is. It's especially fun to hear the grandkids. I love that people are using this concept. Another great concept is, um, besides for favorite three, or putting the favorite item in the, in the box, which I absolutely love, or talking about it with family, another way that you can do this, by the way, 
Um, an alternative to this is a gratitude journal, which we hear a lot about, where you just write it down in a book. Um, another thing that you can do is actually get out and write a letter. Once a week, just write a letter showing gratitude to somebody, an old mentor, somebody, an old neighbor, somebody who impacted your life that might have no idea that they had that impact on you. Um, what we find with gratitude is that when we show gratitude, it doesn't only impact the person that we're showing gratitude um, to, it actually impacts us greater. Well, David, I just have to say, um, as you can see, like the comments or have heard the comments coming in, this was really, I think, what everybody needed. What a great way for the middle of the week to finish it off. I mean, I certainly feel like, wow, like I feel like I just had a big weight lifted off of me. So I just admire your positivity and I love your family stories. I think they're so relatable for many of us on so many levels. And I just really like a lot of the things that you brought to today's table. And um, I, I, I just want to thank you for your time as well, um, and as well as the other David, too. Um, but thank you both so very, very much. And I don't know if we do have any last minute questions or comments from anyone today. Yeah, if anybody has a question, I'm, I'm here. And if you can't think of one now, you can certainly reach out. Um, I'm very accessible, so um, email, phone, text, whatever, just give me 24 hours to get back to you. <laughs> we'll certainly share your information, as Renette said. Um, so with that, coming to an end, I'm going to just share my screen really fast to show the information for the credit, but again, we'll distribute this after the meeting for all the attendees, as well as the uh, video recording, and David, too, if you wanted to share your PowerPoint presentation. Um, also, I want to say I love that you use Poly because it's something that we were trying to start using on MS Teams um, because yeah. Teams doesn't have that poll feature that Zoom does. So I liked you using it and seeing how it did work really well with your presentation. Yeah, thank you. That, we can talk about that for sure. I, I'm a big fan. There's <laughs> a lot of capabilities. With, uh, so Poly. I'm going to share the screen. Um, for, let me see if I can find it now. Sorry, I have like a million windows up today. Uh -huh. Get this. Okay, let's see here. And um, there we are. Can everybody see this for today? And then I'll leave it up for just a couple of minutes. And again, if um, there wasn't enough time, we will certainly distribute this out. I know we had to have a couple of members leave because they had prior commitments. It seems to be the way of the world. It's Zoom meeting, Teams meeting, back to back to back to back, right? Or if you've got kids um, going on their um, Google Classrooms or whatever that they're using for school right now. So um, if you didn't get this, uh, we will certainly share this uh, with everybody after today's session. And again, just a huge thanks for everybody attending, um, for David and David. And we just wanna say, we hope that you have a very safe and wonderful Thanksgiving. Um, let me see, does it have, nope, I guess it's it. Oh, hold on, there might be someone in chat here. I'm gonna stop my share. Nope. Yes, Deborah, thank you. So Deborah also said thank you, David, and to the chapter for the, the meeting and happy holidays. Um, and again, yeah, everybody just have a great Thanksgiving, have a wonderful holiday, be very safe and best to you all. And we'll um, see you next month. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye, Bye. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving, Thanks, David.